Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jasmine Correa. Thank you for uh, joining us on our third Development 101. Um, and thank you for joining me and my team on our permits breakout session. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Jasmine Correa again. Um, I am a project facilitator with the Facilitation Division and Development Services. And I will actually go ahead and get started promptly with um, fire prevention. We have Adam Thornton presenting for us. Adam, did you want? Okay. Afternoon, I'm Adam Thornton with the uh, fire department. Uh, I'll be the one to review all the plats that come in uh, whenever y'all start the development. The main things that we look for on the uh, platting side will be your emergency access easements slash fire lanes, your hose laid distances. We also do all the approval of the street names whenever y'all send a list in. We'll uh, review them and approve them or deny them. Make sure that we get all the gas well setback distances located on the plat uh, and the correct number of access points uh, for either apartments or residential neighborhoods. Emergency access easements are recorded and uh, named fire lanes for addressing purposes. That's what you'll see in uh, your apartment complexes. Whenever we make it a uh, emergency access easement, basically that just gives the developer the right to put gates on it versus just your normal uh, mutual access easement that Target and Ross and everybody else shares. Uh, fire lanes are required to meet the hose distances. Uh, there's two different types of uh, hose laid distance. There's from the hydrant to where the fire truck's gonna park. And the other hose laid distance is from the fire truck around to the back side of the structure. If you have uh, just your normal Single, single family or uh, just commercial building with no sprinklers, 150 foot hose lay from the front to the back. Now like apartment complexes, you're gonna get uh, sprinklers in every one of them. That allows us to increase from 150 to 300 feet by doing that. Whenever you, uh, we used to do all the street name reviews during our uh, pre-platting but we found that final platting was taking too long to come through because we can only reserve a street name for one year before it's up for somebody else. So we now decided we're only going to start doing street names during final platting. Once you have final platting or a final short number assigned, you can come to us and then we'll start reviewing. No more during the pre-platting process. And that's basically all I've got. Y'all got any questions for me? to the fire hydrant. So it's gonna be a distance. Your main, from the hydrant to the fire truck, usually within 600 feet. You have to have a hydrant within 600 feet from where the fire truck's gonna park. Now, whenever you start putting sprinklers into it, you're also gonna have a fire department connection. So then you have to have it within 150 feet. The hydrant has to be to meet the, the current 2001 fire code. See, I'm not, I'm not part of the permitting, pro is that you? No. Yeah. Thank you. Sometimes you can get report review only way. Perfect. Uh, well, I get reviewed and then at the final last time, then you got Thank you. Any other questions for Adam? Thank you. All righty, thank you. Next, we have transportation impact fees, and we have Lori Lewis and Laura Young. You want the clicker? Yeah. Hi guys, I'm back. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you about transportation impact fees. And uh, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with this, but it can be a little complicated, so I'm really gonna try and make it as uh, simple as possible for our scenario with Bob's Bistro. So Bob needs to know does he, what it is, does he have to pay and when? So first, 
he needs to understand what that fee is. So that fee covers the costs associated with any major regional transportation infrastructure improvements. So what does that mean? So, you know, if you think about development, if it's a growing community and we put in Chick-fil-A, really like Chick-fil-A, and we put in a Walmart and we don't care for the traffic and the transportation around those sites, we're gonna have a problem. So it's the city's responsibility per state law as well as city ordinance to care for that. So we have a whole program in place and it's quite complicated. We do studies every five years. We have a committee that monitors this program um, and then the calculations can be a bit tricky. But that's the point of the fees. So does Bob have to pay? What Bob needs certain information before he gets started. He needs to know for his final plat when it was approved, not recorded with the county, but just approved. That's important because as I stated, we do a study every five years. So that date is going to tie you to that study since we do it every five years. So that's one piece of critical information for Bob. He also needs to know, oh, and we call that schedule one. Schedule two, collection rate, that is based on when the building permit is accepted by the city. So accepted, what does that mean? That means Bob is ready to submit his building application. Bob fills out the application, he looks at our requirements, and he submits a package to the city. We receive that package and we go through it and did Bob supply all of the pertinent information to move forward with that building permit? If he did, then we accepted it. And that's the date you're gonna go with when you're trying to understand what your fees are. So again, plat approval date, not recording date with the county, and the uh, building permit, the date your submittal was accepted. Something else that Bob needs to know, in order to get his building permit issued, he needs to pay this fee. So that's also critical. All right, so now that we understand that, how do you estimate the fee? Thank goodness we have an estimator on our website. I've worked in other cities and that doesn't exist and it's just, it's very hard. Anyway, so if you think about it, you wanna buy a new car, you wanna get a house, you use those loan calculators to help you figure out what you're gonna pay and how much it's gonna be and how many years, things like that. That's kind of what this is, we call it an estimator and you need three pieces of information. I already talked about two, the final plat, approval date, the estimated building permit acceptance date. So let's say you're in the beginning phases, right? You went to your PDC, they told you what your service area was and you wanna get an idea, what is this fee? Cause I gotta build it into my budget. You can estimate what your building permit, when you plan on submitting and accepting, when it will be accepted and you can just um, enter that date. So it's an estimation in the beginning. Eventually we'll firm up that number. Service area. So there's several areas that Bob can go to to understand what his service area is. So the city takes the map of Fort Worth and it breaks it out into 20 plus service areas. So Bob needs to determine based on his location of his development, what service area he is in. So how, can, how does he do that? I talked about one address, which is a tool on the homepage of our website. He can type in the address and it will give him his service area. Bob can go to the PDC. Our members, Laura joins our PDCs and she will tell him, this is your service area based on your site plan and use that you shared with us for the PDC, this is the estimated fees. So he can get the information through a PDC as well. Or he can simply call us and we will help him determine what that service area is. Okay, you can find the estimator on our website in the search engine, tra transportation impact fees, and you'll find our estimator. Okay, so let's talk about the fees. Bob is ready to move forward with constructing his new, new it's gonna be new construction for his building. And we already set the framework, right? It's a multifamily, a bistro, and a vacant space. So Bob is going to submit a commercial new building permit uh, because we don't know what all of the land uses are. We only know two of the three. He's going to submit it for the entire building shell, so that's the shell, and 
the uses based on the square footage. So let's look at this. We know that he has the multifamily. We deem that multifamily low rise, 25 units. We know that is 20,000 square feet. And then Bob is high hopes for that bistro. It's going to be fine dining. So based on that use, uh, 10,000 square feet for the bistro. But we don't know what the vacant space is gonna be. So we have to make an assumption at this point. So we're going to assume it's another restaurant, another fine dining. So based on that, multifamily low rise, 25 units, 20,000 square feet, fine dining for both the lower levels, 20,000 square feet. We enter that information into the estimator and we come up with a total of $364,000. So this is what Bob will have to pay before that commercial new building permit will be issued. So that's the initial step. Bob is ready to move forward with that bistro and he's ready to finish it out. Building's complete, ready to go, and now I'm gonna move forward with my bistro. So what does that look like? Cause hey, I already paid fees, why do I have to pay more fees? So he is going to complete an occupancy change of use permit. We call it a PO permit. He's going to check the box for remodel. Uh, it will be for the first finish out and a certificate of occupancy for the bistro. Bob did the numbers, he went through the business plan, looked at his funding. He's gonna tweak his business plan. He's gonna change from fine dining to fast casual restaurant. It's gonna increase his revenues. It's gonna help him with his plan to move forward. And Bob is good with that. But he changed the use. So now we have to see, based on the change of the use, are there any additional fees? So what he's going to do one thing to keep in mind, right? Traffic, parking, folks going to a fine dining restaurant is different than a fast casual restaurant. So the intensity increased. So this is the calculation. We know that he paid for the fine dining, 10,000 square feet, he already paid 137,000. But he went to his estimator, now he entered the use uh, fast casual, 20,000 square feet, and it kicked out a number of 225, so 225,000. So that's how much it is for the fast casual. We subtract what he already paid, the 137. So for the bistro, it's an additional 88,000 for him to move forward with the bistro. Has to pay that before they will issue the PO permit. Let's go to the multifamily. Again, he's ready to finish it out. Occupancy change of use permit, PO permit, click remodel, finish out, certificate of occupancy for the multifamily. So did Bob make any changes to the multifamily since we last spoke? He didn't. He stuck with the 24 units. He stuck with the 20,000 square feet. Nothing changed, no new fees. Good to go there. So good news for Bob. He doesn't have to pay fees for that. Good news for Bob. He has a tenant for the vacant space. His tenant is going to be a dentist. So now we have a use. But if you recall, we assumed fine dining. So let's go through that exercise again, right? Go into the estimator and enter that information. So for 10,000 square feet, uh, the dentist, which we deem clinic, that's, that's the use, clinic, uh, that is going to be 188,000. He already paid 137,000 as fine dining. So we just take the difference and that's 51,000. So in order for the dentist, and for this one, the dentist is going to submit the uh, permit, the PO permit, and he's gonna pay that fee of 51,000 to finish out his dental office. Okay, so that explains the calculations. Any discounts? You throw me some extra money, some discounts here. There's several. Not many of them apply to, to Bob and his bistro. But let's go through them and a little complica complicated. Okay, adequate public facilities discount. So let's say Bob is in a two-lane highway, right, that fronts his building. And we know the ultimate uh, layout of that road is supposed to be six-lane. Had it not been built out to its maximum capacity, he could apply for a discount. But 
Am I getting that right? But because uh, the road has been built out, it's six lanes, it's really nothing else to do, it's at its max capacity, therefore Bob doesn't, um, wouldn't qualify for this discount. The second one is extraordinary investment discount. So if Bob was investing $25 million into his property and he was uh, hiring, is it 25? 25 employees or more at two times the um, minimum wage, then he would, he could apply for this discount. That doesn't apply to Bob. This third one is mixed use multimodal development discount. So if Bob was located near a rail station, a bus station, anything where folks aren't actually driving their cars, but they could leverage that mode of transportation, then he could receive a discount. Bob's nowhere near a bus station or a rail station. But small business discount, that's gonna work for Bob. That will work on the finish out. So not on the new construction, right? That shell building, just building it out, but it will kick in for the PO permits. So for the bistro and for the dental office, he will qualify. And there's some criteria with the small business because we have to make sure it's that small business segment. So for the small business segment, now I'll have to look at my notes on this. Um, he can only be open for over a year. He has to have 25 or less employees. And what was the other thing? Franchise. Franchise. So we're not gonna offer small business to McDonald's, okay? So it, has, it can be a franchise, but it has to be less than five. So those are, that's the criteria for him to qualify for the small businesses discount, which he does. So this is just giving you an overview of what those discounts look like. Ideally, you'd go to our website, get more information, but give us a call and we can walk you through whether or not that discount would apply. And you think that covers it? Yeah. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Where are we in the buying window until those fees could change again? So our most recent study was done in 22. So we'll have our next one in 27. Mm -hmm. 27, yeah. Usually our AD, Jennifer Roberts, uh, this, is, this is her segment, so I'm just filling in. So hence me referring to Laura sometimes. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you for your time. I'm going to pass it off to Jeremy. Thank you. I think I need that too. Hello, uh, my name is Jeremy uh, Bishop. I'm with the Fort Worth Fire Department, uh, like Adam. Uh, my colleague couldn't be here today. Her name is Sheila Dotson. Uh, we both together do the addressing for the fire department. Um, I think something we didn't say, we're underneath the Bureau of Fire Prevention. So, um, we assign addresses a number of ways, but as far as development goes, typically that's with a recorded plat. Okay, so the once you guys record a plat, this is actually something I wanted to mention that wasn't on the slide. The When you have a recorded plat, it's very important once you record it with the county that you also get it to the platting team because that doesn't just, that doesn't automatically transfer. Um, like both, both sides don't always talk to each other, right? So it's important that, can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, sorry. I, I can't hear myself. Um, but once you record your plat with the county, you're going to want to uh, get it over to the platting team. Okay. And you're going to also want to get over a CAD file. Um, and then what that does is helps the GIS integrate when they go and put the addresses in and get everything structured and built. Um, so that we can, as you're building out the real land, we can build out the, the virtual land or the, you know, the, the computer land, right. And get it all uh, rectified and, and, um, and be able to kind of service your needs that way, okay? So all that to say, once you've recorded your plat, make sure you get over to platting. Once that happens, platting is going to get it to us, okay? Once we receive the plat from them, we will go ahead and address that. Um, it can be anything from a single lot uh, to, a, to a large subdivision, you know, a, um, the planned community or whatever you want to call it, okay? Um, so typically we would assign one address for each lot, um, sometimes you may see there will be two addresses on a lot 
if it's on a corner. Okay, so for instance, if it has frontage on both sides, we would not want to hamstring you by, by telling you which way you need to do your, your buildings, you know, which way you have to orient your buildings. Um, so you would choose the building, you know, you would choose the address that it's oriented the correct way, okay? I did give some of y'all in the back my, my card, and, I, and I'll give you guys up front my card too. I just didn't want to interrupt the first presenter, okay? So, um, but I'll make sure you guys all get my card, and we'll work with you. If you ever have a question, you see a plat, you're like, what, what's happening here? We'll, we'll help you figure it out, okay? Um, you guys have already seen the, you guys already know the public plat directory as well, the, the information, how to access that. You don't? Okay. Well, I'll work to help you guys out with that too. So anyways, so once you have your permit address, it's on your plat. With that means you can come in, you can get a permit, or you can use the SELA program, the platting uh, permitting program, and you can use that address to, to get permits. Okay. So um, just to backtrack for a second, the BFP, which is us, the Bureau of Fire Prevention, I think I told you, which is addressing is under. Okay. So we'll approve one address for each habitable structure, okay? So let's say your project is a large warehouse and it's gonna just have a large platted piece of land. You're gonna take that platted piece of land, you're gonna have one warehouse there with one occupant, you're gonna use that address and you're gonna be good to go. You probably won't need to talk to us again, okay? Well, let's say your project is a strip mall, that's what we call it, is that, is that accurate? Is a strip mall? That's a common terminology, okay. So it's like a strip mall, you know, you would have multiple suites, that's when you would contact us. You would send in a site plan that showed demising spaces and showed each of the tenant areas. And then we would go ahead and give you addresses or suite addresses for each of those and maintain the shell building address for that lot. Now let's say it's even different there and you have a complex of those type of structures. Then we would give you a new addresses for each of those other structures beyond the initial address that was given. And we would assign suites for throughout. It would be what's essentially called a site plan or an addressing plan. Something similar that we have. So I'll just pass these around while I'm talking so you guys can look. These are just examples. These are arbitrary sites. Okay, it's nobody's personal information or anything like that. Um, this is just like, a, these are examples of what apartments would look like. And so they would have the different addresses on there. We would assign different addresses to each building on that structure. Um, and then around that site, sorry, and go from there. This is something that's gonna be, I'm gonna be ahead of myself. This is just an, what would be known as an addressing letter. And I'll talk about that later, but you guys just wanna see an example of that as well. This happened to be the one for City Hall that we did earlier this year, okay? Do you have any questions right now as we're going so far? Yes, ma'am. How long does it take to do the address? So we have up to 10 business days, but it rarely takes that long. Okay. So we, we typically, depending on workflow, um, you know, we, we have different things we have to do, site visits sometimes, we have, um, development one-on-one -on -one conferences we have to prepare for or to, to present at, um, different things where we might not have um, be right on top of our computer. I mean, I, I get them, I try to get them out within the same, you know, half of the day. You know, if you send, me, send it to me before lunch, you'll probably have it by the end of the day. Um, but some days it just doesn't work out that way. We, we, we typically have about a one-day turnaround, but we have up to 10 business days. So that's a good question, Lori. So just to make sure I'm not misrepresenting myself, the entire process, I don't know how long that takes. Once it gets to me, you have, yes. So, so I, you know, we, I don't have any, for lack of a better term, jurisdiction on anybody else's time or anything like that. But I can tell you that between Sheila and I, once we receive a project, um, we try to get it done as quickly as we possibly can. And we get it done within 10 days. That's, you know, essentially what's required. Um, but we don't really have, I mean, they're saved for a few, I've only been doing this for, you know, maybe six months, I guess, or eight months. So I'm fairly new. Um, yes, congratulations. You're doing great. But the, you know, we, we, we've only been a few instances in all that time where it's taken longer than, um, you know, than maybe five days, six days, you know, it's just, it just, sometimes it happens if there's huge projects or things like that. But we usually contact the folks and just ask them to be, you know, please work with us. We're, we're trying to do the best we can. So, um, yes, sir, do you have a question in the back? Did I answer your question, Lori? Okay. Yeah, does the developer provide uh, preferred addresses and they all check them or do y'all just blank it aside? So that typically doesn't, it, now, just to answer both parts of your question, so we don't typically, we don't blanket assign, you know, we're, we're kind of basing it on 
uh, most efficient and and you know the most expedient response uh, possible for 911 services, which would be ambulance, fire, police, you know, things like that. Um, we would certainly listen if you guys had, you know, like if, for instance, you wanted a certain vanity address or something that just worked well for your plan, or I, I don't know the, all the different situations that might occur, but if there was an address that you were really, you know, big on, we could certainly look at it and work with you on it. Um, one of the things I do want to caution Jan though is, is don't get ahead of the, the program by, by already putting out those addresses and, and then just hoping that we're going to stick to that one. You know what I mean? Because there may be reasons that, that you all might not know why we wouldn't want to use a certain address. And so, you know, if there are reasons where, like before the project starts, like, hey, this address would really work well because of the because it, it makes sense with the title of our business or, you know, it's something, the van, the address is really good because we like the street and it, it works well with, with our marketing or whatever that might be, we'll certainly listen. But... We just don't want that to be a license to go ahead of the process and, and already start using those addresses before we assign them. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, I, mean, I was just thinking as far as, I mean, if there was a Crested Ridge a certain distance away, you know, you're not going to use that address. Same thing with the Crested Ridge and the Crested Ridge Road. Same thing. Sure. Yes, sir. I do, yes, sir. And so, um, and that's actually maybe a question for for you, Adam. If you do you want to address that, or yeah, actually, if a street name comes across and it's in not just in the city of Fort Worth, but just any city that connects to Fort Worth, it, it can't be used. But I understand, like things that might be confusing or things that might be, you know, misdirect somebody to a wrong location or something like that. Yeah, well, and if you, I don't know everything. So if you if you happen to see something that we don't, or you happen to know of something that that we might not. You know, we have, we're roughly a team of four that handles all this for the entire city of Fort Worth. So by all means, we're not all knowing. So if there's something that you see or you notice, I mean, we're, we're all in this together, right? We're all doing this to try to make this all work out. So we would certainly want to help you any way we can. Okay. Does that help? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Did I finish the slide? I think I did. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So that was how we do the addresses with a plat, okay? If, for instance, we need to do an address letter, okay, we need to add an address or something like that to a lot in order to, um, for instance, sometimes this is all new development only. Is that correct? Okay, never mind. Sometimes for existing, there we may need to add an address or something like that. This is how we would do it. I passed around that letter. Um, well, for instance, that was an address change for the, this building. Was The address was changed, Um when the city of Fort Worth took it over as city hall and was moved to Fort Worth trail as opposed to energy way. And so that would have been the vehicle we did that to. So that address letter, what that does is it goes out to a number of like 35 different people. And that includes the post office encore, you know, all the utilities It'd be ways, Google, Apple maps, all those folks. Um, and so that's, that's very good. Uh, Tad is a very important one. I missed. Um, if y'all end up having issues with your address, you know, for instance, you're not having mail delivery or you're having issues with Encore, things like that. Nobody in this room, I can't imagine, no offense if you work for Encore. Nobody wants to be on the phone with the utilities, right? I mean, it just takes it takes a long time sometimes. So we have we have the ability to contact those folks. We have direct numbers, things like that, that we don't like to give out, but they're very responsive and we're able to, to deal with those things. So if you all need to just contact us, just let us know and we can try to help you out. Um, it's also like, for instance, the USPS, we we make sure that they get our get our address. You know, get your address so that you're getting the mail and receiving it appropriately. Okay. Um, maybe any questions with that? That piece right there too. It, it's it's not really stated, but it's, it's it was kind of implied. But like for instance, that USPS. That's one of the important reasons why we run into issues sometimes because people will self assign their self suites. They'll give themselves suites. So they'll just put them on the buildings, and. and and certainly we can all figure out what would make sense, right? For a, for a building numbers, you know, you have multiple units. We, we can understand sequence, right? But there's other things to that. And, and so that's why it's, it's important to include us in the process because we're able to make sure that these different folks get them. And then there's not an issue with, with electrical delivery, you know, cause they won't, they won't give you a meter if you don't have an address on file. If you don't have an address on file with us, then they don't have an address for you, which means they won't give you an extra meter. Um, USPS won't deliver your mail. There's things like that that are, you know, it's a pretty painless process to work with us. Most people would say, not everybody, but um, so. That's what I have there. Does anybody have any questions about that slide before I move on? 
Okay. So um, just to, so Bob, Bob's having a lot of trouble now. He cannot get a temporary address. Okay. Meaning, uh, for instance, I had somebody the other day contact me and ask me for an address. They said, it's going to be a while for this project to get going. Uh, we just need an address because a lot of these, these, uh, Things are going to be shipped. It's going to take a long time for it to get here. So we just have an address just for now, so the things can so we can have the the items sent prior to recordation, right? So, which means the address we have to change once it's recorded. We just we just don't do that. Um, I believe uh, Cody, you had said that they have re review only addresses, and that is one thing we can do. But it literally will say review only on the address in the permitting section. Okay. Um, so I did give the folks in the back, and I have more cards for y'all, um, but you can contact either myself or Sheila or just a blanket to addressing at fortworthtexas.gov, okay? Um, do y'all want to write that down before before the cards? Um, like I said, my name is Jeremy Bishop, and I'm a lieutenant with the fire department, and we'd be happy to help you. Um, Either there or else you can, you can use my phone. I can, I can give you my phone number as well. But email is really the best way because you can send us the information right there digitally. And we're able to use it most of the time before we even get back to you, have most of the stuff figured out for you before we even have to make contact. Um, so maybe questions about anything I went over. I think that's my last slide. Yeah, it is. Anybody else? No? Okay. Let me pass out those cards real quick, Cody, and then I'll leave you alone. All right, hello. I'm Cody Hughes, assistant building official uh, over plan review and the X team and the walk-in team. Um, so if anybody reviewed your plans, they're usually under me. Um, talking about Bob and his bistro and his multifamily, does it need a permit? Yes. What's going to be reviewed is the building, electrical, mechanical, and plumbing. And we typically get that done. First comments are within seven business days. Um, if you just to let you know, if you want your permit to be to get out, okay. So if you want your first comments to be out, um, or if you want your permit to get out quicker, make sure you have everything submitted that were you required to submit in the first place. Um, typically, we get it out in seven business days. I think right now we're at like two or three days. So um, this is what you need to submit. This is all on the website. If you're doing new construction, additions, remodels, accessory structures, and it's different for residential and commercial. Commercial obviously is going to require a little bit more. So this is all on our website. It shows you what's required. It has links to what you need. It will take you exactly where you need to go. If you have any questions, contact one of my examiners, contact me, contact somebody before you come in and submit, or you're not going to come in because most people are going to do it online now, but um, just you can contact us, ask us if you have any questions or if you're confused by any of the requirements. Um, if you need permits in the future, these are some of the things that you need a building permit for. Basically, if it casts a shadow in the city of Fort Worth, you're probably going to need a permit for it. Things that don't need a permit. Um, this is a list. I'm not going to go over it, but these are on our website too. They're under our amendments, under the administrative amendments, and this is a whole list of things you do not require a permit for. These are the current codes that we are re reviewing all permits and applications. Um, again, I'm not going to read them all, but it's basically the 2021 I codes, 2015 International uh, Energy Code. We didn't adopt the 21 because we didn't like some of the things that were in it, and the state didn't adopt it, so we didn't have to. Um, we're under the 2023 20, Electrical Code, and the 2017 ANSI, and the 2018 International Swimming Pool and Spa Code. Come, codes come out every three years. We adopt them usually every six. Um, again, like I said, I'm over to the X team. If anybody knows what the X team is, it's basically a group of examiners that um, you can have a meeting with. And as you apply for the permit, you can have a meeting with them. They will sit down with your design team and get it done within that day so you can leave with your permit that day. It's right now, since the fees have changed, it's $1,100 and $1,125 an hour with a two hour minimum for each um, meeting. And every time you submit a revision, that counts towards that. Um, right now, Bob's not going to use the X team, so we're just going to go through normal applying for a normal permit. You can do that at Citizen Access, which again is on the city website. 
it's pretty easy. We just um, finished a new online submittal form. Please be sure to read that before you submit everything um, for your permits. Some other things you need building permits, urban forestry permits. Um, if, you're, if your project is over uh, $50,000, um, you'll need to go to tabs and get a number for that for the accessibility. You'll need a certificate of appropriateness through zoning, a grading permit, if it's a new permit, and a registered contractor before the building permit will be issued. You don't need it when you apply for it and for it to review, but to, for it to get issued, you have to have one on file. Um, some of the things plan review is uh, responsible for is customer service. Again, walk-ins or one-day permits. Walk-ins and 24-hour review are a little bit different. 24-hour review are any permits that are under 6,000 square feet. That is, a not, that is not new construction. So a change of use, remodels, things like that, you can do, we'll review it within 24 hours. If you want to come in and do a walk-in, technically don't even have to come in to do a walk-in, but there are certain things that are walk-ins that you get that day and it leaves 24 hours. You submit it, we review it in 24 hours, that doesn't mean you necessarily get it because more than likely, there could be some issues that you've got to address. Um, again, we review the building, mechanical, plumbing, accessibility, and energy codes. And we are the team that opens all your your workflows for everybody else in the city. So if you need something opened, you can contact me or my team. We might tell you no, because there's a process that you gotta go through of letting everybody review it, answer their workflow, and then um, we will put it on corrections required or approved or whatever it might be. And then we expedite review sometimes if you just call us and say, hey, you know, my um, ICRP took six months longer than it was supposed to. Can you help me get this out because my permit's about to expire, which I don't have a slide for it, but we do extend permits 180 days. You get a one-time extension. Um, every approved inspection, Adam might talk about this later, but every approved inspection gets you a 180-day extension. So contact your building inspector sometimes so that he can come out and get an extension um, that way. Uh, one other thing I was going to address or is asked to address is with the temporary um, temporary address, that is a $1,000 fee. Again, the fees have changed, so it might be $1,100 because everything went up 12%. So it might be $1,125 now. But there's a one-time fee to, to do that without a final plat so that you can get that temporary address. Any questions? All right. So everybody knows everything what to do. <laughs> You. Yes. Then I'll add the building permit um, that you apply for with the temporary address will not get issued with a temporary address. You can't get your building permit issued if you have a temporary address. So you've got to get file file approved before it gets issued. So you apply with it and start the review process, but it will not get issued until you get the file. Okay, so it's not a review only address, not a temporary address. Okay. Oh, sorry. I mean, technically it's temporary, oh, right, but yeah. Yes. So, and that brings me, yeah. So if you have a review only way address, your permit will not get issued. So in your planning of what you're doing, make sure that everything pre-development is done. I'm pretty much done before you uh, apply for your building permit, but your building permit is only good for 180 days and you get a one-time extension. So technically, let's just say you get a year. If anything pre-development you know is going to have issues or take longer than a year, because sometimes they do, I wouldn't apply for your building permit because once it expires and we give you that one-time extension, you can't do it again. You have to go back and apply again. There's some fees that you're not getting refunded before it won't get transferred over. So what's the benefit of having a temporary address? Um, there's Yeah, there's some benefits. Um, there's multiple, I guess, benefits, but it's just up to you just saving time if you need to do that. That's what I've heard, save time and money. All right, so my name is Casey Nettles. I do everything grease traps, yay! Um, also liquid waste. Um, I didn't bring any cards because I am unprepared for life, but if you want to take down my name, Casey Nettles, our city email is firstname.lastname at fortworthtexas.gov. So if you need anything grease trap related, you can email me. Email is the best way to get a hold of me. All right, so does Bob need a grease trap? Yes, all food service establishments are required to have a grease trap. Um, and 
we hear from some people that, oh, I don't need a grease trap because we don't fry anything. So the fry grease is not associated with your grease trap. The grease trap is going to be taking everything that goes down the sink, everything that goes down in the drain, uh, floor drains, three comp sinks, all of those fun things that health is going to talk about here in a minute. Um, and so again, this is not the grease from the fryers that goes elsewhere and it doesn't go in the grease trap and I don't want to hear about where it goes. Um, so how should Bob size his grease trap? If you have 20 people, we have about 20 people in this room, we'll say, there are going to be 20 different ideas on how to properly size a grease trap. We had to come up with one, so we threw darts at a board and we picked um, the uniform plumbing code, Appendix H, which is the peak meals formula. Some of y'all who have done this before are going to say, Casey, that was from 1986, and I'm going to say, yes, I was four at that time and it was great, we're not going to fix it. Um, so that's what we use in Fort Worth, that's our standard. So if you want to use a different one, if you want to use DFUs, if you want to use the hydro mechanical trap, if you want to use the 2021 International Plumbing Code, whatever they have in there, fantastic. I'm excited about you using that. If it doesn't meet our volume for our uniform plumbing code, we're going to have to have the facility fill out a little bit of extra paperwork. Um, and that's just a variance. And the variance just proves that that smaller grease trap, that that hydromechanical, whatever it happens to be, that it's actually going to work for that facility. That facility will have to collect samples and prove to us that it's meeting our local limits because we can't just have people putting in grease traps willy nilly and saying, oh, yeah, it's a 50 GPM gallons per minute. Um, it's about this big and it's going to be fine for the swing stop that we're putting in um, because no, it's not unless you're doing some amazing kitchen practices. Um, so again, uniform plumbing code. So if you get a little corrections required from me that says your trap is undersized, please install an adequate um, size grease trap, update your plans, or submit a variance. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so what else does Bob need to do? He needs to cre complete a grease trap discharge permit application. I will not approve your permit, your PB or your PO, without having a grease trap discharge permit application on file and the grease trap permit fee paid. So even if this is going to take two years to get, we still need all of that before I can actually click that approved button um, through Acela. Um, for the grease trap fee, you can do that through the Acela, what is it called, the customer portal? citizen access, that magical place. You can go in there. You don't even have to have an account. You can just put in the PO or the PB number and get on that uh, pay fees. And that way everybody can get it taken care of. If you are really gunning to come and see a 1930s building from the outside, um, we have a drop box that you can drop off payment or grease trap applications. Um, we're just like down the road here. Um, and so you can do that. We don't have people come onto our facility usually because we are a, an active water plant. And so there's Homeland Security, all kinds of fun stuff that happens. But if you need to talk to us, we're always willing to talk to you. Um, and then the permit application, you can upload that to a seller. You can email it directly to me. You can put it in our Dropbox. You can mail it to us. I have had people text it to me, whatever. As long as it gets to me, we're good to go. Okay. So back up on this, grease traps. It's a bit of a misnomer that I only do grease traps. I also do uh, oil water separators for your elevator. So if you have a hydraulic elevator that's going in, or if you have an elevator going into your building, please tell me if it's an electric traction or a hydraulic. If it doesn't tell me, I'm going to assume it's hydraulic and I'm gonna tell you you need to put in an oil water separator. So that's gonna be a corrections required that you're gonna have to come up with and say, no, Casey, it's an electric traction. Um, we also do trash compactors. Trash compactors are considered grease traps. So if there's a trash compactor or a trash area that has a drain that goes to sanitary, it has to go through a grease trap before it gets to sanitary. Um, we also do pretreatment industries. So some of our large scale businesses, um, even our smaller ones like our chrome platers, um, also like battery manufacturers, that kind of stuff, um, they would have to go through a pretreatment review. So you might see something on there that says, uh, submit an industrial user survey. That would be part of our group that we would do. Um, grit traps for your car washes, your automotive shops, all of that, that's all coming through my office. So just because it says grease traps, I don't just deal with grease. 
Um, but do y'all have any questions? No? Food and beverage? Yes. If they're preparing on site. Correct. Yeah. So um, if we go from, basically we look at a 7-Eleven where they're doing heat and serve or a concession stand where they've got a nacho bar, that kind of stuff, on up to full-scale restaurants. Um, so if they are doing any sort of opening of packages to serve people not in their original packaging, then yes, they would likely need to have a grease trap. Yes. So would you would have you put one grease trap for the corporate side of the local location? Do both of the restaurants have their own grease trap permit? Yes. We're going to make this super complicated. So um, the two facilities will need to have their own permits. They will need to hold their own grease trap permit. It can all go to the same grease trap as long as that grease trap has adequate volume to handle both of those. Um, that being said, one of those facilities is going to have to say, hey, I'm going to be the one responsible for pumping it. And they're going to have to fill out a little bit of extra paperwork just so that we know they're the responsible ones. But if you look at it from a mall perspective, so we have one grease trap for Hewlin Mall, and let's say it's 4,000 gallons. We need to know everybody that's going into that because grease traps aren't bottomless pits. So we need to make sure that we're not overloading that grease trap and causing grease to go into the city sanitary line. Yeah, but we do allow those community traps. Um, if it's a small, two small facilities like this, um, probably we would look at about 1,000 to 1,500 for each one. So a 3,000 gallon should be adequate for those two facilities. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, y'all email me if you have any questions. Hello, everybody. It's a tough crowd. This thing's on. Okay. I'm Adam Artemez. I'm the assistant building official. I am over the team of inspectors uh, that are going to be conducting your inspections uh, when you start construction. So just so I can know my audience, how many of you are going to start construction and go vertical without any inspection? Any of you in the room are going to do that? No hands. All right, great. That's great. Thank you. So take advantage of that stakeout inspection. That's like our courtesy first inspection uh, to kind of understand our process of inspection. So our inspection types, you've got building, energy, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and gas, residential, parkway, which is right away, just so you guys know, aprons, approaches, uh, sidewalks. Um, We've got change of use, temporary limited permanent certificates of occupancy, uh, enforcement, and everybody knows what enforcement is. You're doing work without a permit. We're going to send an inspector out to investigate uh, signs and gas wells. So, well, we were supposed to take off the names because this, this is a rotating list sometimes. Uh, but our inspection team consists of specialists. And when I say inspection specialist, that's going to be your mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and your building inspection uh, for structural. And we have senior combination inspectors, which are more for the commercial and residential. They're um, inspecting all, all four fields in trades, uh, building, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. And we have our combination inspectors, which are more of an entry level residential and complaint investigation, uh, work without a permit, those types of things. And we have uh, 33 districts. So we do try to have uh, all the districts assigned for your inspection process. Um, if you have a question about that, we can go over that uh, later. But uh, it's a large jurisdiction. And obviously, um, there's a lot of coverage involved. Some of the larger outlying areas, um, you know, our ETJ, they're not necessarily in the jurisdiction, um, but it is a lot to cover uh, for inspection process of your, your project. So the process of inspection is going to be your stakeout, and 
The stakeout really is your first initial contact with that inspector. So take advantage of that because that is your, that, that first inspection can give you a lot of guidance to be successful on that project. Are, is anybody in the room an owner that's gonna try to run their own project or is everybody design professional contractor or developer in here? No, no private owners? Perfect, all right, that's great. So, because um, there's a lot of work involved with your inspection process. And to be successful, you definitely have to know how to manage your inspections on that job site. The inspection process, what to follow, what types of inspections to request at the time, you know, during your construction. So that stakeout is important um, because that's your preliminary layout of where you're gonna place this structure in relation to your property lines. That's very important, right? Because we do not necessarily require a form survey. Now you're probably getting a form survey because you wanna make sure you don't pour concrete in the wrong spot and have to rip it up. So, but that stakeout is, that's what's involved. The piers, the foundation, the framing when you're going vertical. Um, and again, I'm hoping you called for inspections before you started going vertical, because that's, that's hard to work backwards for us, because you should have had underground by then for your plumbing, maybe some electrical, possible duct banks. Um, so then you've got your insulation, your firewall, your energy, and your finals. So mechanical inspections, they are gonna consist of your rough-in, your ceiling, your duct, your hood, your energy, and your final. And uh, again, any questions on mechanical type of inspections? None? Okay, great, thank you. Electrical inspections, you're gonna have possibly a T-pole for temporary power. You're gonna have your underground, your rough, your ceiling, your energy, and your final. Any questions on electrical? No, you guys are a great crowd. You're right. Yes, yes, sir. So is this Bob's Bistro is commercial? So you've hired a design professional to do your comm check, and there's a lot of inspections related to that. We're, we're definitely going to look at your insulation. There's going to be uh, requirements for lighting. You, you might have a circulation pump requirement on your, you know, your water distribution, uh, obviously your HVAC. But your question, to be specific, obviously we're going to check the insulation. At the final, it's important to make sure you've got your fixtures right for the efficiency. So is there anything like specific that you want to know that maybe we're not doing right that you're concerned about on inspection process? No. Yeah, we're not going to do your blow door test if there is one required, obviously, or, you know, check all the details of that submittal. We're going to look at the basic requirements, um, the highlights relating to the code. Um, if something's not right, our inspectors are going to flag it and, and they're going to give you the violation and, and document it and then, you know, allow you to make the corrections. Has there ever been an issue with the project that you are aware of on? Okay. Okay. I, just so you guys know, I, my cards are up here on your way out on the desk right there. When you walk out, if you want to get my card, you guys can call me anytime. Uh, I'll do my best to respond timely. So plumbing inspections, uh, we got your underground water sewer, your top out, which is like your rough in on your drain waste and vent system, your gas, your energy, and then your finals. Any questions on plumbing inspections? Change of use. Uh, I don't, this must not have been the updated slide. Hold on a second. Certificates of occupancy. So obviously the goal is to get the certificate of occupancy, but many people want to start occupying prior to the project being finished, right? You want to do furniture fixtures, you want to stock, you want to train employees maybe. So you've got to get a limited certificate of occupancy if that's what you want to do. If you just want to finish your project entirely and have a full certificate of occupancy, that's great. You can follow that process also. Um, if you, yeah, we didn't update this slide because fees, that is the correct fee. 
because we did we did change our fee structure. Um, so if you want to do a li limited certificate of occupancy, that is basically a temporary certificate of occupancy. We call it a limited uh, certificate of occupancy, and that sometimes confuses people. It confused me when I first got here because most jurisdictions call it, you know, a temporary a TCO. So uh, that's what's involved. You know, as I explained, the finished or the unfinished building for the occupants, you want to put f furniture in stock, train, uh, fixtures. Uh, 60 day maximum is what they state, but that can be discussed with the inspector or the application when you uh, submit it. Um, all the, the trade inspections have to uh, be made and approved and fire department has to approve also. So uh, certificate of occupancy being permanent, again, all trades, fire has to approve, all your landscaping has to be finished, your address has to be visible from the road um, according to the code. That's really one of the most important things on your building is that address. I stress that all the time. And that's just for emergency personnel to respond. Um, it's the worst thing for a firefighter or paramedic to respond to a building they can't find an address on. It's pretty hard to, because seconds matter. Even when the job is active, it's really important to keep that temporary, you know, that not temporary, it's your permanent address, but keep it posted on site. Because if someone chops his arm off or falls on a piece of rebar, you want that paramedic to be able to respond and find the site. It's really important. Um, I stress that a lot of times to general contractors. That's it. Yes, sir. So what's the big difference between the limited or the temporary certificate of occupancy? It's, it, the temporary is a limited certificate of occupancy. Yeah, That's what we refer to it. Well, the regular certificate is your complete. It's full occupancy. So, so it goes back to just landscaping and address being permanent? All right. All, all your... Fire has to be yeah. All, all departments related, like you might have health involved. It just, I mean, health, health is involved with Bob's Bistro. So all the I's have to be dotted. The T's have to be crossed. We're going to do the final check. Before we issue final CEO, we're going to make sure all the departments have signed off for approval on a certificate of occupancy for full occupancy. Am I not explaining it good? Well, I, I thought you were saying that all the people have to sign off on the limited one as well. All trade and fire. They have to approve because you're going to make an application for temporary so occupancy. But they, it, it hasn't had its final check. Is it, it different? Right. They're, gotcha. But they're just giving that partial approval or temporary occupancy approval also because I, I have to respect the other departments for that process. Fire department might see something they don't like for that temporary occupancy, and I've got to respect that and let them, you know, perform their their related inspections. Same with the health department; they may not have signed off on something yet. They may not like what they see. They might feel like it's not ready. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just see where the health department does not have a say so on when they administer the occupancy. We should have that before we walk in. Okay. So you don't do anything temporary. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. If we issue a temporary health permit, it is because something is holding them up and they need to be able to stay on the or something's happening. So if they don't issue a health permit, they don't have to worry about the health permit. And if you guys already signed off on all your inspections, they okay. just don't have their full certificate of Okay. We, we are the last that we wait for all the other departments to get to those. Yeah, okay. So. We're the only ones that don't really have anything to do with this. Okay. So, in full disclosure, I want everyone to know. This is, I'm, I'm coming up on my one year anniversary. This is a huge machine, uh, Fort Worth. And I'm excited to be here because I, I, I like the user friendliness of the department with the inspection process of which I'm over and being a partner in that process of construction and develop to the end, right? Because this is a win win for everybody. So I'm still learning a lot of the dynamics. So I'm glad that we're having this because, again, I'm going to follow up because there's, I have questions about pools, commercial pools, all those things. I've experienced that this first year with a commercial pool. If I said the name, you'd know right away. But um, so if you guys have questions, call me. 
if I don't know the answer, I'm going to tell you, I don't know the answer, but I'll make sure that you get a hold of somebody or I find out and I can resource it and reference it, whatever I have to do to get you the answer. And it's, uh, I, I like to say that the inspection team is fair, but firm, right? Because we need the, we need it safe. We need it to be up to code. We're, we're not going to just give you something. It's, it's got to be right. Um, we do go by the book. Um, and there is some flexibility, obviously, and we try to have that when we can. And if you don't agree with the call, you can follow that protocol, chain of command. I respect that. If you want to call right to the mayor, you're allowed, right? Because that's how some people feel they're going to be more successful. But I would respect if you go through the protocol, talk to the inspector, you disagree, you can elevate to a supervisor uh, and then to the assistant building official and to the building official. And if you're not satisfied, you're going to keep going up that, that uh, ladder and follow the protocol. But again, we try to solve problems. That's what I try to do every day with any project uh, because it's, it's important that we get it right and we educate the public and developers, contractors on how to be successful. That's, that's the goal every day. So are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, so you've it's you want an inspection tomorrow, right? Is that what your question is? And you requested it today. So is there going to be a rollover? Have you experienced rollovers? Okay, we we have had rollover issues, but I believe we've accomplished eliminating rollovers uh, fairly well. It doesn't mean we're going to guarantee that there won't be one, but if you request today, you should have. I mean, up till six thirty in the morning you should be able to request an inspection for same day. So today you requested it, you should have it for tomorrow on the books. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, you guys are great, thank you. Consumer health. Thanks, thanks for helping. Always. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's what we're here for. All right, hi. They saved me for last. I have to wake you up. I really don't know. Do I need this? Are you guys good? Oh, for the, yeah, the camera. Okay. Um, so I was a bad girl too. I totally left my cards at home. Um, if you need to get in touch with me, I'll give you my phone number or you can write down my name and email me at any point. All right. So Bob wants to open a restaurant. Yay, Bob. <laughs> We have a few codes that we follow. Obviously, FDA code is our big one. We follow all of that. Um, then we have TEPR, which is our Texas code here. And then, of course, we have our Chapter 16, which is our food code here in the city of the, uh, Fort Worth. What cannot be used? A residence. No, you cannot cook food out of your house and serve it to people, even if you are giving it away. I don't care. You have to be in a commercial kitchen. The location must be connected to city water and sewage. Space must be provided for employee belongings. It is very important that you give your employees space to put it, otherwise they are going to shove it somewhere. Generally speaking, someplace that they're prepping food. So they must have a place to put their stuff. Um, they must have conveniently accessible restrooms. This is a huge thing right now. We've got some new places opening up that want to have their restrooms on the outside of their building. Consumer health does not approve of this. We are hoping, hoping, hoping to find solutions for this problem. Um, unfortunately, the code does state that as long as you can get to the restroom, it's accessible. So we would prefer that you do not put your doors on the outside. Do not make your employees go out into the snow or the rain to use the restroom. Um, customers may not walk through your kitchen to get to the restrooms. These are very important things. You'd be surprised. All right, what do we look for? Big important things that we're going to look for in your plans. How is your food getting to the building? How is your food going to be stored? How is it going to be cooked and prepared? What are you cooking and preparing? That's a big one. Um, how will the food leave the kitchen and be served to the public? And then, of course, how are you going to wash and clean dirty dishes and equipment that you have? 
We review everything on your plans, your mechanical, your electrical, your plumbing. We look at it all. Are we the be-all, end-alls and know exactly what we're looking for? No. But what we're looking for is do you have adequate equipment? Do you have electricity? Do you have lights where you need them? Do you have the proper air gaps in your plumbing? Is your grease trap not sitting in the middle of your kitchen floor? These are all things that are very important and we must look for. It is important that did I... Totally missed that little bit. Certificate of occupancy. So we kind of brushed on this. Health is your last stop. We make sure that all the other departments have done their inspections. Everybody is done. And then we come in for your final. So you should either have your LCO. That is a requirement. Can we issue your health permit on an LCO? We can if and only if all other departments have shown the inspections completed. Fire has signed off, water has signed off, electrical, everybody has to have signed off and we can issue. But generally speaking, we require that certificate of occupancy, the final one, before we will issue your health permit. There are exceptions, obviously with anything. What are the standards for floors, walls, and ceilings? Three golden rules of health, anybody know them? No? Smooth, non-porous, easily cleanable. Golden rules of everything that you do in health. What's our last one that we love? Light in color. You cannot have black ceilings, black walls, black floors in your kitchen. Why? You can't see the dirt. It's great, it hides it, but we don't know that you're cleaning it. So light in color is our nice little kind of end of the road. Stud joists and rafters may not be exposed in any kitchen prep food service areas. This means everyone likes those big, huge ceilings with the rafters all wide open. That's fine in your dining room, but you cannot have that in your bar area, in your kitchen area. Drop down ceilings are recommended so that you can clean them, so that you can see them, so that nothing's going to scurry across those joints and rafters and drop food or Gush knows what else they could drop off into someone's food. Carpeting. Carpeting is not permitted in any service areas. Prep, cook, clean. Can't have it, so no carpets. Can you have it in your restaurant for your dining? Yes, but you cannot have it in any food prep areas. All right, plumbing standards. A hand wash sink must be complete conveniently located and provided within 15 feet of all food preparation areas. So when it comes to your hand sinks, think about your hand sinks in a radius of your kitchen. If you have a straight line shotgun kitchen and it's 30 feet long and you stick your hand sink right in the middle, you've got 15 feet this way, you've got 15 feet this way, completely fine. You stick it at the end of your line, now you're gonna need another one at the other end so that they meet in the middle. Does that kind of make sense on that 15 foot radius? The only thing that you really need to pay attention when we say easily accessible, you cannot walk through a wall, obviously, can't walk through a door, and you can't walk through equipment. So you have to think of the path that you're moving through your kitchen, is that hand sink easily accessible? Because we know Let's be honest, once that fry guy is going, he's not going to walk to the end of the kitchen or around the corner to go wash his hands. So we have to determine that easily accessible part. All facilities are required to have a three compartment sink. You must be able to wash, rinse, and sanitize your dishes. Even if you have a mechanical dishwasher, you are still required to have a three compartment sink, minimum requirements. You must have a mop sink. You have to have a way to get mop water, a place to dump your mop water. Your three compartment sink is not sufficient, nor is your toilet. Uh, food prep sink may be required, depends on your menu. So this is why the health department always asks in the beginning, what is your menu? What are you cooking? We need to know so that we can make sure you have the right equipment to do the job that you're about to do. Um, backflow prevention, obviously that comes from our backflow department, basically an air gap. You need to have them. Grease traps cannot be located inside the kitchen area. Does that mean that you absolutely cannot have a grease trap inside your building? No, there are exceptions. Casey makes the exception. She suggests this grease trap is sufficient. Then we come through and go, okay, it just can't be in your kitchen. It needs to be somewhere that's safe that cannot contaminate things where you are prepping food. 
Um, hot water must be sized to meet your peak demand. Everyone right now loves, loves, loves their tankless water heaters. They're great. They're awesome. Instant hot water. However, in a busy kitchen, when you are washing your hands, doing your three comp, you have guests in there. If you run out of hot water because your tank can't keep up, then you're going to need to add another one. If we come into your facility during operation and you do not have hot water, we will have to close you down. It is an automatic closure. So we will a lot of times in your plan stipulate water heat water heater must be large enough to meet peak demand. That's what we mean by that. Sometimes you'll have to add an extra one. We'll let you get by with one, but if we come in and a year later, it's not keeping up, we're going to make you add. So have that thought process. And then you have to have floor drains for cleaning purposes. You have to be able to mop and clean your floors. What are standards that are considered for variances? So there's lots of variances. Everyone loves the big, huge roll-up doors right now. They want everything wide open, and especially when it's nice in the springtime. Yeah, that's great. But you can't have it opened into your kitchen. So there's variances for out of openings. If you're going to have an open concept restaurant, your kitchen still has to be closed off. You still have to have some kind of door. You can't have a wide open restaurant and a wide open kitchen where bugs, flies, pests, whatever which can crawl into there. So those are things that we will offer. We will also offer variants for a three compartment sink. That only applies to a bar area. If you are only a bar, and you only have a three compartment sink, you can't get rid of it, there's no variance for it. But let's say you're a restaurant and your three compartment is in your kitchen and you have a bar up front and you're gonna have a mechanical dishwasher up front, we could sometimes do a variance for not having a three comp in that bar area. So that's what we mean by that variance. You gotta have at least one, no matter what. Um, and then of course there's rules about dogs and all kinds of variances, but those are the three that we see the most. Outer openings, three comps. All right, what inspections are required? So, you have some major plans. Health has done the review. We've gone in. We've approved your plans. These are great. We're going to send out these nice little comments that hopefully you guys read, which we know you really don't. But we tell you to please read them. So at the end of all this, it's going to tell you any changes to your plans without approval from health may cause in delay of construction and denial of health permit. So if you decide to change your stuff mid-time and you don't talk to us and tell us anything, when we come in and do your inspection, we're going to go, we can't permit you. You're going to have to fix it. So if you change stuff in the middle, you need to let us know. Because basically, once we approve your plans in Excella, we don't talk to you guys again. Unless you call us, we're not going to see you again until you're ready to open about seven to 10 days prior to opening, you should call us, schedule your appointment. We come out, we do a pre-op inspection. We see where you are with your certificate of occupancy, and then we move along. We'll come back for a final, get all of your final permitting, and then you can open. Just because you get your CO doesn't mean you can open your doors. You still are required to have a health permit before you serve the public. Got it. Good. Okay. All right, that's it. Anybody got any questions? None? Good, that means I was very thorough. Yes, ma'am. So, um, we can do expanded our space. Mm -hmm. uh, I already have occupancy, and I already have my health permit, all that, but we expanded our space, and so our occupancy changed. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask a question. What did you expand? Did you expand your kitchen or just your no, dining? Kitchen. Nothing changed to the kitchen. Just your dining area? Yeah. In your dining area, no. You do not need, to. we'll come out and do an inspection if you need, or you added a bar over there. But if you just went into the suite next to you and added seating, that doesn't change your health permit. Now, if you remodel your kitchen, then we need to come out and check. Now, changing your seating capacity might change your grease trap rule. Yeah. Okay. So that's something that when if we're doing like a remodel or something like that where we take over the suite next to us, um, our group grease traps will look at it and see um, is the grease trap that we have on site still adequate to include that new area, that new space. 
and we've had a couple of restaurants recently. I think I know which one yours is, so you don't count. Um, but we've had a couple <laughs> ones recently where they've taken yeah, on the street. We yeah. 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 Um, where they've taken on an extra suite, and that's increased, that basically doubled their seating capacity, and so their grease trap is not adequate for their use. So they've had to sign on to that variance program to collect samples and basically do best management practices in the kitchen to prove to us that that grease trap is going to work for their increased capacity. Mm -hmm. Where's like the tiny line between like a bar area? Is there a lot of bar areas or open air, you know, in a kitchen area that's not supposed to be open air? Like so so it, Technically, yes. Yes, your bar is a food prep area, but you're not making all of your food from scratch at your bar. You're serving people food, which is why we can do an outer open as variance. But your kitchen, where you're actually handling, prepping, and making the food, can't be open to the outside. It has to be enclosed by something, um, generally speaking, screens. Uh, air curtains are not generally satisfied um, for that. When we see that... Restaurants are going to do the big, huge doors. We do make them put doors into their kitchen and verify that those doors are at least stopping with a swing. Something is preventing that from just going straight back. I don't. Yeah. Your department six. Are you enforcing the independent range from each outlet on each compartment? That's not us. Yeah, That's. So you don't pay attention to that detail. Mm -mm. Okay. No, because it's not part of our health code. Our health code doesn't say anything about what it. That's the plumbing code. Correct. Correct. Yes, sir. So there are a lot of people that want to smoke and cook things outside. They still have to have an enclosed space. So they'll have to build some type of structure with screens, doors, and depending on what you're doing out there, um, a hand sink, quite possibly. It really depends, but you have to have that second structure and it does have to be completely enclosed. No pests, no bugs. That part would be the building code and zoning, and they would take care of it. We don't regulate how far away you put it. Um, we will take it in consideration of what you're doing out there and whether or not you need a hand sink. Um, because sometimes we've had structures that literally come straight out the back door. They are doing nothing more than walking into the structure, putting the meat on the grill, and walking out. They're not seasoning out there. They're not cutting out there. They're not serving out there. And there was a hand sink that was completely right inside the door. So we allowed them not to have to put a hand sink, but they still have to have a completely screened-in structure. Yes, sir. Uh, no, sir, we're still off of Missouri Avenue, 818 Missouri. That's our building, the Hazel, um, Hazel Harvey piece. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do, yes. Is there uh, your contact information? Yes. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Um, so my first name again is Lori. It's L-O-R-I. My last name is Milliner. That's M as in Mary, I-L-L-I, and is N as in Nancy, E-R. Sorry, I have a brain fart. And my phone number is 817 seven zero nine seven two nine eight and i apologize about the cars guys i'm going to say this so we did not talk about it but any of you that are building homes hoas and pool structures um the only inspections that you are required to have during your construction process are mainly for pools you are required to have a pre-gunite inspection and a pre-plaster inspection if you miss these and you go on and build your pool without them, there is a very good possibility that we will come out and make you break up your concrete and start over. So please, 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 if you are building a pool, the two inspections during construction, pre-gunite and pre-plaster. Any other questions? All right, I'm all done. Alrighty guys, so that is the end of our presentations. Does anyone have any questions for any other past presenters? Um, yes. Where do grading permits fall? Your grading permit would be in before building permits, it would be that's a presentation before us. <laughs> um, that would be platting infrastructure. Yes.
Any other questions? Okay. Um, I handed out the survey sheet. If you would please do us a great favor of filling out the survey, we would like to hear your feedback on this presentation, but also how do we uh, best prepare next year. It is my understanding that next year we would like to host these quarterly um, different topics. So if you have any recommendations, topics you're interested in, please include that in your survey so that we can plan adequately for next year. Yes. Alrighty, guys. Well, that's it. If there's no other questions, I appreciate your time. And thank you. Y'all have a nice rest of your day.